Hello and welcome to History Hack. Matt here today because we have a really exciting episode for you. Marcus and I have buried the hatchet and joined forces for this one because we have a really dear subject close to our heart, haven't we, Marcus, to talk about today? We do. Uh, uh, quite a bit more poignant uh, in, in theory, but we're going to be joined by two excellent uh, source information uh, experts on the topic. Uh, we're going to kind of commemorate and celebrate uh, the late, great Professor Richard Holmes uh, on what would have been his birthday. Uh, and we're joined by, well, do you want to introduce our first guest who, who knew him? Certainly. We, we have Peter Caddick Adams with us, who's an author, academic, broadcaster, a history hack regular as well, um, who's joining us from sunny Croatia. How are you doing, Peter? Very well indeed. It's great to be here, commemorating the most fantastic individual I think I ever met in my life. The sun is shining down on me at the moment, and I, we're probably about 10 degrees warmer uh, than you are back in Blighty. Um, but I'm here um, loafing around because I've got two books to finish off, uh, and this seems to be the place to do it rather than uh, grey skies and acres of snow that I think you're, you're labouring under at the moment. Well, it's, it's not too bad here in Sussex at the moment. Um, long, long may that continue, um, but <laughs> I've said that, it's going to snow now. Um, and we have somebody else as well. We have Cameron McNish, who's a retired lieutenant colonel in the Royal Logistics Corps. Um, he may sound funny, but that is because he is Australian, but we will not hold that against him. Cam, how are you? I'm very well. I'm very well. Looking forward to the ashes. Uh, and uh, <laughs> my, uh, my dual passport allows me to support whichever side is winning. Um, and uh, it, uh, I would dearly love to go back to Australia to watch some of it, but uh, I suspect the, uh, the, the dreaded COVID um, hotel saga will probably be carrying on for a bit longer. But I'm very well, thank you, and uh, very honoured to be brought in to uh, proffer a, a couple of thoughts on, on, the, on the late great man himself. Uh, Peter knows him far better than I did. Uh, my, my meetings were, were, were very fleeting, uh, and uh, I've read one of his books, but, um, yeah, happy to be here. That's great. We were just telling old war stories and putting up a sandbag before we hit record, weren't we? And uh, telling some of the tales of how we knew or met or were inspired by uh, uh, Richard Holmes, which is really what we're going to be honouring today. Um, Matt and I have got much less to say. So if we start with yourselves, um, maybe Peter, you have two hats that you knew him under, uh, both academic and uh, army reserves, or as it was the territorial army. Um, can you tell us how you came about both of those ones and how you met him? Yes, I mean, Richard was uh, the uh, TA brigadier, in other words, chief of the, the, the UK reserves, not in the army, in fact, but the uh, the RAF, the Royal Navy and the Royal Marines. Um, so he got to the rank of, of brigadier or one star equivalent. Um, and uh, at the same time, he was uh, beginning his War Walks series, which is probably how a lot of us first came across him. Um, uh, he'd written a lot of books by then uh, and eventually wrote 26, which is a staggering number. Um, I've only written six and it's nearly killed me. Um, and how he ever managed to fit that in on top of you know, a regular job as, a, as an academic uh, and then the head of the United, United Kingdom's reserve forces, um, I'll never know. But there he was, um, uh, to six, 12 episodes uh, of War Walks. And they're still, you can find them on YouTube. They're, they're regularly repeated. Uh, and that's how many of us sort of came across him uh, in a very sort of public way. Um, uh, and uh, I was already a, a sort of practicing uh, academic military historian and battlefield guy and thought, wow, this this man um, communicates his passion. Where's his knowledge likely? Um, and has brought military history out of what I would call anorectum. This was, uh, he, he communicated so well. He, he triggered interest in you know, every possible age group and demographic that you could think of. So the, the first time I came up, I, I bumped into him at a TA function, Territorial Army. I said, you know, how do uh, you know, the, I also want to travel in your direction? Uh, and that opened up a channel of communication. And eventually he said, well, why don't you come work for me? And uh, so he, he nabbed me and I got a job as uh, his lecturer at the Royal Military College of Science, as it was then now the UK Defence Academy at Shrivenham. 
Um, and at the same time, he said, look, I'm the, uh, the TA Brigadier. I need a, a, an ADC. So uh, you, you carry rank in the uh, t- Territorial Army, your Yeomanry officer, as I, as I started. Um, can, you, uh, can you be my ADC as well? So he was twice my boss. Uh, and this came to the fore um, in uh, 20, oh, when was it? 20, uh, 2002, um, when the Second Gulf War was about to kick off. And I said to Richard, look, I'm then, I was then with the TA Media Operations Group. And I said, listen, I'm, I'm almost certainly going to be mobilised. Um, I'm giving you advance warning and I'd very much like to go. And he said, well, as your, as your brigadier, I, I thoroughly approve. And I think this is a wonderful idea. But as your professor... Um, I'm really worried about how we're going to plug the gap if you disappear off for however long this is going to take. I will have to go away and have a conversation with myself. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I really love the uh, photos you were sharing last week on uh, Twitter, I think it was, where you're both kind of doing a double act of, you said, out of the anoraks, but it was definitely into the really strong tweed on the battlefields and uh, lots of good hand gestures and motions. And uh, certainly out of my memory of watching him on war walks with a moustache and a tweed jacket and probably an SMLE rifle, no more props are needed. Um, and, and Cam, you experienced some of that yourself on, I want to say on the ride. Was that right? Yeah, I was on a, uh, what the military call a staff ride, a military historical uh, trip. Uh, to to uh, a battlefield, and um, I was uh, Lieutenant Colonel at Headquarters, First UK Armoured Division. It was immediately after the uh, the Gulf War. Uh, the GOC uh, Major General uh, Peter Wall, subsequently uh, CGS, uh, wanted to study First World War, so he uh, attracted uh, Richard's attention uh, by means I have no idea. We had to do a bit of research and and, and pre- preparation for it, and we. We all uh, decamped from Hereford in, in Germany across to uh, London, where, where we met Richard in the flesh. And I'd seen him on War Works and all the rest of it, and was as absorbed by, by, by many of us by his uh, the way he comes came across as Peter so eloquently described. Uh, and we went to the uh, the old War Office, which was uh, just up in the MOD on, in, in Whitehall. And he described how the general staff in in that building, in that office, in that on the same table, had planned the deployment of the British Expeditionary Force, the BF, to to uh, to, to uh, Belgium in uh, in August 1914. Um, and it was quite. It, it, it was the first time I'd, I'd actually experienced that, having been in the same place as as the great and the, and, and the good, as it were. Uh, and um, and then we uh, hopped on a bus and shot across on the way to Mons, uh, be, being being the ever consummate professional military historian, we diverted the bus to Cressy, uh, which was uh, 1346 rather than 1914, and uh, he uh, gave a, an animated description of how the English longbowmen uh, annihilated the French uh, crossbowmen um, uh, under Edward III, and then we went on to Mons, which formed the front line of the uh, the canal there, where, where uh, the first engagement was uh, was met with the Germans and. And what I really uh, enjoyed about uh, Richard's uh, uh, passion, which was came across on war walks and all the rest of it, was was that it was exactly how he was in the flesh. Uh, there was no difference. There was no side to him in, in, in that respect. And uh, going from the grand strategic, as, as I was saying earlier, uh, saying where the, this core was and that core, um, and oh, oh, oh that we the British Army had a core these days, to down to the corporal or the sergeant. And Peter would know, know this guy's name, the machine gunner who ran out of ammunition as the Germans were approaching, chucked his machine gun into the canal and then, and then wounded back. And, and, and uh, Richard gave it a, a very, I'm sure, was a perfect impersonation of this wounded uh, Irish soldier uh, moving along the railway line. And, um, and uh, so he appealed both to the general and, and the senior officers who, who liked the higher level stuff, as well as to the corporals from, and, and sergeants with us who didn't necessarily get the high level stuff or didn't have, have as much traction for it, but absolutely loved that which to which they could relate as, as, as NCOs. And that's what I think was, was uh, a strong suit of his. Yes, it was totally kind of approachable from all angles for different people. 
thanks so much, gents. We're gonna we're gonna dive into this more in a moment. I actually want to know um, for my esteemed colleague uh, on the podcast today, Mr. Matt Bone himself. How did you come into it? Because this was your uh, baby. This idea of this podcast to kind of honour him. How did you kind of come into uh, Richard Holmes? It was it was War uh, I, th- I think that probably goes for quite a, quite a few people in our listeners. It was. You know, it was it was my dad and I looking through the TV schedule and going, "Ooh, we'll watch that." BBC Two. It was a Friday evening, wasn't it? I, I can't remember really, but we were just both wrapped. Normally, we would talk through these these shows and try to outdo each other with trivia, but we were just both wrapped by by Richard Style and you know, as as Cam Peter both said, just that wonderful way he had of describing things. And I watched a few of them um, this this week. And thinking I could do some prep and bits and pieces and have them on in the background. And, you know, damn near 30 years on, I just ended up sitting there and watching a couple hours back to back without really doing the things I wanted to. Because, A, I was, you know, relearning things yet again. And it's just, he is such wonderful company to to spend some time with. Um, And that, you know, that was it. And, you know, to to, to realise, as we sort of said at the end, it's it's 10 years since he passed. And, you know, he would have been 75 I think on the day that this episode goes out. So let's spend some time celebrating him. A man who I unfortunately never got to meet. Um, I was supposed to go, or he was supposed to be at an event with Bernard Cornwell that I had a ticket for, but he was very ill at the time. Um, so um, Richard Kemp filled in. Um, not so ably. Sorry, Richard. But um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but that, 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 that was, that was a, a, about... About as close as I ever got to the man. So this, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about this. And the, the chat we had before we started um, was brilliant. So we're going to tap into some of that now. But Peter, you, you, you mentioned War Walks. I think from a lot of the responses we had, War Walks lives on with people. What, what, what were your memories of, of, of that and, and how Richard put those together? He was lucky um, that he had done quite a few television uh, episodes before, one-off documentaries, which he'd written and presented himself. So he had a handle on um, how to write the scripts and really make sure the material was his. And he pitched this to the BBC just as the 50th anniversary of um, the Second World War closing years was finishing. Um, So we just had all the highs of of 1994 and the the 50th anniversary of D-Day and so on. And he began filming almost sort of straight away. And what what he really, the genius, uh, was um, uh, not doing just First or Second World War battles, which uh, a lot of other people could have done, not quite so ably. But he demonstrated his range as a historian. I mean, he said to me, listen, if you want to uh, sort of follow in my footsteps, you need to start with the Romans and the Trojans and Greeks and then work your way up to the present day. Um, And, of course, you know, so many of us and so many academic historians have their favourite periods and they literally dig trenches and never, never sort of come out of them. And he taught me this lesson that you've really got to understand the hinterland and, and the evolution of warfare through the centuries. And not just from a, a uh, you know, an academic point of view, but walking the battlefields. That's a thing he taught me. And I had sort of started to do this, but he really stretched me and pushed me in every sort of possible direction. Um, and so we did many together. And it was a huge privilege because the very first one was, was almost a test without realizing it. He started delivering, and I just wanted to sit at his feet and listen. And you, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, you, you, you try and you, know, you, you turn on uh, war walks, and you rich, literally want to sit cross-legged on the ground and, and listen and soak up um, all of this wisdom. Uh, and that was what he was like every time. And, and the moment I wanted to switch off, he suddenly stopped talking, looked at me, and we played military history rugby. Uh, and I never knew when he was going to stop and, and uh, throw the ball to me. Uh, and so, you know, you really had to keep your your, your uh, sort of wits about you. Uh, and it was all done with no notes. That was the entire thing. You, you, I, I learned that. You, you, you just had all your material up in your head. Um, uh, because I'm one of those people who, if I've got a piece of paper in my hand, I'll look at it. So it was very good sort of advice not, not to sort of have, have uh, anything to clutch onto. Uh, and it just then made it far more spontaneous. And actually, it was a very, very good trick 
um, that, that he taught me. So I did some of the sort of research and preparation for the sort of war walks. And those all became battlefield tours and staff rides that we did for the military, but also all the sort of the great commercial companies, Major and Mrs. Holt's battlefield tours no longer with us or cruise ships uh, um, and cruise lines like Swan Hellenic again, no longer around difficult times at the moment anyway. But I mean, he, I think also really created so many things. I mean, he got the battlefield tour business sort of really underway and popularized it in a way it's never been before and just made military history so accessible, but took it out of just one or two particular periods and joined up the dots. Uh, I mean, the first episode, first series of, of War Watch started with Agincourt, uh, went through Waterloo. There were a couple of First World War battlefields and a couple of Second World War. And then the Second World, uh, second episode uh, of series of War Walks started with the Hastings uh, and then went to Bosworth and, and English Civil War, uh, ended up with Dunkirk and the Blitz. So, I mean, that, that range is something that very few historians would ever dream of tackling. And, and he he just had that knowledge that of, of you know he was a forensic researcher, highly accurate. But how many academics have got, also got that gift to be able to communicate? And that was Richard, sort of through and through. On that, Cam, you you you, you mentioned that when you're talking about when you're at Mons, you had a quite wide grouping of quite senior military figures and quite. <laughs> I don't want to say lowly, but you know, the, the rank yeah. and file there. Yeah. And he was able just to bring, bring everybody together with, 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 with that knowledge and that enthusiasm. Well, I mean, P- Peter's described it perfectly. His, uh, his passion uh, for, you know, and, and we had some quite sociable evenings. Uh, and so there were some, some less than a hundred percent attentive individuals first thing in the morning, but before long, um, his passion just or instantly really just dragged, Dragged us into the moment, uh, and to, uh, a, a, a hoist in aboard because as, as Peter, uh, described it, the, 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 just the absorbing manner with which he, uh, presented from the, the unbelievable, uh, brain that he had and, and, uh, as I say, being able to describe the high, the high level and the low level, um, kept everyone in, 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 engorged on, on the, the protein that he was he was uh, discussing uh, with with ab- absolute rabid uh, absorption. No, it absolutely did, and it always just comes back down to me. He, in his war walks, you know, I've, I picked up the copy I've got from 1996 for two two pounds. I think there's a sticker on the inside of. Can you remember when you could buy a, a book for two pounds? And uh, you know, it, it starts like you say. It's got Agincourt, and then it goes via Waterloo, and then. Mons, Le Cateau, Arras, Operation Goodwood, all within one small book. And then I was watching very recently the the one on YouTube, I think, of him going through the streets of London at night on the back of a green goddess, um, screeching into the forecourt, basically, of St. Paul's Cathedral and the, the square there and talking about the Blitz. And that's a, that's a huge range. And to actually interest people who, you know, let's face it, as military historians, sometimes we don't actually engage that much with other people's eras we get a bit turned off by them and actually he just has a passion for them all as well as the knowledge which is evident but the passion's there it's calmly delivered and there's no big special effects it's a man a nice jacket a mustache and one prop and that's really all we've got on a battlefield and actually it proves it's probably all that's needed there's no costumes or anything too extravagant. And we are engrossed within that hour. It's all we can think about is the history of that year. And a, and a horse. And a horse, yes. Of course, I mean, there's that, uh, there's that other side to Richard, which is that he was a very good ho- horseman. And he acquired a horse called Thatch, which was the most expensive member of his household, as he always said. Um, uh, and so Thatch appeared in every uh, episode of War Walks and everything else he could think of, um, because that way ta- Thatch became a tax break um, and was very tax efficient. Um, <laughs> but he would ride, he would ride uh, uh, Thatch uh, at all sorts of opportunities. Um, and he, he did several big battlefield rides. Um, and the first became 
uh, was turned into a book called Riding the Retreat. And he rode the route of the British Army's retreat from Mons, which we've just explored, back to Lakato. And we're talking sort of August 1914. And, and this is all about Richard being hands on in terms of understanding the uniforms and the equipment. Um, and, you know, you, you, you saw the various episodes where, the, where he was handling muskets or wearing armour or, or um, loading a, a 303 Lee Enfield or scuttling around a Normandy bocage with a Panzerfaust. Um, and, and Thatch was very much part of that. And I always remember him saying, you know, part, part of the, the, the lesson he learnt uh, about riding the retreat of the British Army, which took, you know, a week uh, and left out all of those who survived absolutely knackered. As Richard said, you know, you, you, the first thing you did was you, you mucked out your horse um, uh, before you looked after yourself. And you, the astounding thing was just how dirty you got in the course of a week. And after a while, you didn't mind how dirty you got. And that was the British Army in August 1914 in retreat uh, and quite often at other stages as well, completely and totally grubby. And there was, there was Richard sort of reliving it uh, as realistically as you possibly could. And, you know, how many historians go to, to, to those sort of lengths? And this came out uh, from his time at Sandhurst when he was a military history lecturer. And the head of the War Studies Department then um, was a, a, another military history legend called Brigadier Peter Young, who'd been a wartime commando, shed loads of DSOs and military crosses. Um, and it was Peter Young who started the sealed knot reenactors movement where nobody did reenactment of any kind or another. Uh, in the mid 1960s, and this, this was reenacting the, uh, the English Civil War, and Richard became one of his faithful sort of lieutenants. And so, you know, every weekend he'd be out there reenacting a Civil War battle, putting the gear on, wielding a musket, or getting on a horse and, and, and charging the ranks of the uh, parliamentarians, probably. Um, and, and so, his his version of military history was always hands on. You've got to put on a bit of the uniform. You've got to handle some of the weapons. That's the only way you'll know what the experience of a private soldier on whom it all rested was really like. Uh, and that communicated. That's how he communicated to, you know, the, the youngest person on a, uh, a battlefield tour may, who might have been young in age or young in experience, as well as the future chief of the general staff. Because he, he, he'd done that sort of research and, and had worn the kit himself. Um, and, and, you know, again, there's so much to learn from having done that. It's interesting you say, Peter, the uh, mucking out your horse before you feed yourself, uh, because it reminds me of my, my grandfather uh, in Australia who fought in the First World War and was wounded uh, in trenches. And his first experience of a tank was when it almost ran him over. But he, uh, he told me as I was uh, going off to join the army as uh, a young second lieutenant, back when Jesus played fullback for Jerusalem, uh, to uh, always remember to feed your horse before you feed your man, before you feed yourself as an officer. Uh, and uh, so I, that stuck with me. Obviously, horses became trucks, and, and, and I was in the Royal Australian Corps of Transport, in the Royal Corps of Transport. But, but um, yeah, absolutely um, look after your, your, your kit before yourself. And uh, minor distraction on, on, on that side of life, but uh, interesting uh, observation. It's still a saying, don't I? Peter was in the yeomanry, and uh, as I am myself, and you still say your horse, your rifle, yourself in that order. I hadn't realised that actually, which was a, a reenactor, and that, that maybe explains a few things. Well, it also, it also gave him a, a lead into to binding together the various groups in the, the country in a very efficient sort of way. So he became president of the Battlefields Trust, which really only has been around for about 20 years, um, which was formed to sort of protect the battlefields uh, in the United Kingdom from developers. And he became its sort of first president and, and um, it's, it's gone on from strength to strength. But it lobbies Parliament when, when developers want to try and take buy pieces of land on which something uh, historic sort of took place in terms of a, a battle. But he also became the sort of um, uh, director general of the B British Commission for Military History, which is the sort of academic bonding of, of uh, all the sort of war studies and international relations specialists uh, around the country. And then he was one of the leading lights in getting something called the Guild of Battlefield Guides off the ground. Um, and he became its first president as well. So the, the three leading organisations that promote the study of military history or preserve battlefields or um, uh, bring people through 
through to, to learn themselves how to be battlefield guides. Richard was was the head of, um, and it, it just sort of shows you the the awe and, and uh, responsibility, the sort of respect in which he was held, and how sort of seriously he took his responsibilities of making sure that um, mi military history was done as well as it could possibly be in the United Kingdom. So he wasn't just an author who scribbled a few books or a TA soldier who then sort of retired. There was this real sense of responsibility to the nation that we get our military history right uh, and we don't, uh, and we preserve memories, but we also preserve the, the fields of battle as well. And on top of that, of course, he was a justice of the peace. So he was a part-time judge. Was he? So, yeah, I was, you know, <laughs> I, I had real trouble keeping up with Richard. He clearly wasn't busy enough. You know, so to put, put all of that together, it, it meant that, you know, he could dine out every night of the week, um, giving, you know, learned after-dinner talks to and fireside chats to, to people of the length and breadth of the country, and often did. Uh, and very often took no money for it. Um, you know, this this would go to the Army Benevolent Fund. It was incredibly generous in, in, in that respect. And I think that probably contributed to his, his early demise, because, uh, you know, he died far too young 10 years ago. You know, he really gave of himself. And, and at the end, um, of course, he was the, the honorary colonel of the Princess of Wales Royal Regiment. Um, now, that's a regular army uh, regiment in the British Army. And it had never had a reservist uh, as an honorary colonel. In fact, no regiment in the British Army has ever had a reservist as their honorary colonel. So Richard was the first there as well. So <laughs> how, how many different sort of, there are at least half a dozen Richard Holmeses that I knew and met uh, and loved uh, and uh, there are probably many more than I, you know, the family side was, you know, it, uh, Lizzie and the girls was, was a, another aspect altogether. So, um, you know, there's a man who, who lived life to the full in every possible way. And I, I, uh, uh, I he's still there every day. I think uh, we, we used to chat every day and, and there's not a day I think I can honestly say when I haven't missed it. Uh, and I do feel, you know, he's there now just sort of um, tapping me on the shoulder sometimes. You've forgotten this. What about that anecdote? <laughs> just on that, we, we, we put the call out that you kindly shared on, Peter, for, for people's memories of, of, of Richard. And I thought I'd just this would be a good point to throw a few in. Frank Toogood has, has, a, has a lovely memory of, of a, a guide, a Guild of Battlefield guides events at Rusi. He said, Richard walked in with coffee in hand straight up to me and said, I'm Richard Holmes. You under I understand that you served in the Essex Yeomanry. I replied, yes, that's right. Well, so did I. I joined the Essex Yeomanry as a bombardier and left the army as a brigadier. No one really knows the difference between the two. And so that's how I first met Richard. I was lucky enough and very proud to be the first recipient of the Richard Holmes Awards services to the Guild, especially as the award is adorned by British Tommy of the Great War, who happens to be an Essex Yeoman. Thank you for sending that in, Frank. Um, we've got a couple others. which are, there, was, there was loads. And to be fair, I was writing these up as I was watching War Walks, so I didn't get all of them down because um, I was distracted. Dr. Jonathan Eaton makes us all feel old with this one. He says, um, I was fortunate to meet Richard at a public lecture on his book, Tommy. He told a great story about tracking the letters home from a soldier on the Western Front. Turning to the last letter, he realised it was an MIA report. Overcome with sorrow, Richard went for a walk. He returned to his desk in the archive and opened the next folder. The first letter was from the soldier saying he'd been missing for a couple of days, but was now safe and sound. Turned out the soldier lived a long life and died in old age. Richard was an inspiring speaker and an engaging writer with a firm command of the role of personalities, politics and landscapes, everything a military historian should be. As a child, thank you, Jonathan, um, I was really inspired by his War Walk series and books. Um, so that must make him the same age as Marcus. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, there was a, a lovely one here from uh, Peter Doyle. Um, we just simply said a wonderful man, superb writer and public speaker. And in my experience, a generous scholar who's always willing to, to support and encourage others. I'm grateful for the support he gave me. And that is a running theme, I think, that, that comes out time and time again of just, just the man's generosity when it came to, came to his knowledge. He was, he was not someone to, to keep it in, as you were saying, Peter. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I remember when we did the Radio 4 obituary program and uh, I was uh, talking about, 
giving memories of, of, of Richard with my very good friend, uh, Professor Gary Sheffield, um, who worked with Richard at Sandhurst and, and is now Professor of Military History at the University of Wolverhampton, um, and, and General Sir Mike Jackson. And, you know, they both sort of said, with Richard, even if he's your, your sort of friend and contemporary, the moment he started talking, what you wanted to do was sit cross-legged in front of him and listen. Um, and immediately he became, you know, the professor, the schoolmaster, um, giving a lecture. And it didn't matter how senior you were or how knowledge, knowledgeable or learned you were. Um, his communication skills just took over and you didn't want to interrupt. And you just wanted to listen to that wonderful sort of prose that, that he spoke or, or, or put down on, on paper. Um, and, and his li- wonderful sort of phrases, um, you know, he never spoke of sort of females for, for, for a soldier dismissively, um, but there was always a roving eye and a well-turned ankle. Uh, and there were, <laughs> and, and, you know, his his walks around the battlefields were, were punctuated by um, pausing, leaning against a tree uh, and recounting how a German officer in 1914 needed uh, to pause, uh, uh, grab a glass of champagne before going into the, the attack. I think that's a jolly good idea, would say Richard, and out would come a, a hip flask, a sharpener, jolly, jolly welcome on, on, on a battlefield as this would have been. I find it so too when I'm walking the same field. Um, you know, or... or just just walking the battlefields with his practiced eye. Um, and I can remember we, we were walking across a, a First World War battlefield and he picked up um, a clip of five German uh, Mauser bullets that had been shed in a, a, a First World War battlefield. And I think it later appeared in one of the episodes. But he, he just pulled it from uh, from under a sort of uh, a clod of earth. It, it wasn't there before. It was completely spontaneous uh, and you know, produced this history and was able to sort of identify it. When he went to Alamein in uh, in North Africa for part of his other series, which was Battlefields, and, and he was walking across the ground there, um, he found uh, near the coast a, a golden coin from the Ptolemies. Uh, and the, in fact, it was, it was one of the camera crew who sort of found it, flicked it across to Richard and said, what's that? And he said, well, it's, it's like a sort of ancient um, Egyptian coin. Curious, it's still here. And everyone said, why? And he said, well, this was a position that was manned by um, the 51st Highland Division. I can't imagine a, a Scotsman managing to, uh, to to let that out of his sight. There was always a quip. Um, <laughs> and, you know, his he w- w- when he stood up and spoke at a dinner or any of the sort of public lectures we all went to, his turns of phrase were absolutely wonderful. And everybody just remembered the, the sparkle in his eyes. Um, but this, this erudition, uh, and he also made the comment that, that you know, some people feel uneasy about humour on a battlefield, and he would say, well, if you feel uneasy about this, you don't really don't understand British soldiers, because you know, in adversity, the first thing they do is joke, uh, and so we're we're not, uh, you know, we're not sullying their memory in any way at all. Uh, with a few well-chosen quips uh, and jokes, because that's exactly what the, the British soldier does in adversity, and they would recognise that, so don't feel bad. All his choices of words and anecdotes and phrases were, were great levellers, um, because, you know, people are, are worried about academic titles and hierarchy and officers versus other ranks and he would cut through all of that and it really didn't matter who you were he was this sort of very embracing avuncular figure that everyone wanted to be their favorite uncle because that's the that's the role he played to all of us encouraging us um whether you had a sort of family memory or you were looking for help you know his uh, poor old steph muir who was his secretary and, and mine um you know, she had her work completely cut out by this amazing post bag of, of people all wanting help in looking up lost um, ancestors or, you know, where to go or what to do. Lovely man. Well, one, one of the other notes that we had come in, actually, is a, a work of genius by Pete Johnson, who just said, I sent him an email about my GCS course, GCSE coursework on Waterloo. Genius. 
why didn't I think of that when I was doing my GCSEs? Write to a historian for, <laughs> for some help. Would have helped my grades, I think. Um, more in hope than expectation, he says, received a reply soon after with six pages of notes, challenging and engaging with my ideas and full of genuine encouragement. Inspirational. It led me to my current career. That seems amazing. And I, I, when I saw that, I was genuinely annoyed with myself for not thinking about that my, myself back in the day. I remember... Um, uh, the, the interesting dip that from Dusty Warriors when he wrote about when he was uh, honorary colonel of the um, PWR. I, I when I was commanding officer in Northern Ireland, I, I met the chef because I'm RLC Royal Logistics Corps and chef sale part of my corps, my former corps. Um, a guy called Slasher Whitlam, and um, and uh, it just so happened I was reading Dusty Warriors at the time. I said, I've just read about you in a book by Richard Holmes, and he said, What, what do you mean, sir? I said. Were you in the cookhouse, in the kitchen, in Amara, uh, in the Civic House, in 2004? He said, I was, sir. Were, were, you, were you shelled by a mortar round? He said, well, I was outside having a fag. And I said, did the company sergeant major come in and say, I hope lunch isn't going to be late? And he said, how did you know that? He said, it's in the book. He said, read it. <laughs> I, I was really disappointed to find when I was prepping for this, I pulled all my Richard Holmes books off the shelves and they're all in different places because they're different sizes and I, I was hoping I thought Dusty Warriors he'd sign because I'd seen him lecture twice and I was I was knee high I was I was in cadets I think we one was definitely with we were taken there with cadets and one was with my uh, father I thought I know I remember him signing something it must have just been a scrap of paper from a notebook and it, I thought he was in Dusty Warriors but I always remember he was telling a story that the the PWR flew him out to Iraq as honorary colonel and uh, he was saying that he, he got his floppy hat on and he said everyone else tore the edge of his hat, but he thought, keep it pristine, keep it looking neat. So he had this floppy hat all pulled wide and he had a nine mil pistol strapped to his hip, which he thought made him look a bit more like Rambo. <laughs> and, but the floppy hat and the pistol marked him out as a staff officer. So he's walking through and he's got, you know, a couple of ADCs, a bit of close protection in. And uh, he's, he's thinking he's looking very cool. And he was saying this, you know, he kind of cleaned his moustache and he's on he's on stage at Bombington Tank Museum. And uh, all of a sudden, someone just walked past him and went, bloody waltz, and just carried on walking. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, oh, OK, <laughs> maybe I'm just a rent then. But there'll always be a staff officer and there'll always be a Tommy. <laughs> and he said, and just carried on. It kind of made me think, actually. He had such a good insight. I mean... His soldier's book is such a weighty tomes, and Redcoats is just fantastic read. Um, never mind some of his battlefield studies in itself. He, he has such a good insight into the British Tommy, you know, and I think, and also an insight, and also a real affection. It, you know, Peter was saying he was keeping an eye out for an ankle rather than chasing a lady, and it was that kind of affection. What, what probably from you, gave, do you think gave him these insights? Is it is the academic, the reenactor, the the reserve soldier? probably a combination of all but it's quite a unique insight and quite a unique uh, affection just wonder if you had any thoughts on that um it, it was total uh, affection and i think it it's difficult to find that in other writers writing uh, military history because they're either not close to their subject at all um or they're they're completely blinded by it um, and he'd always he'd grown up with first world war veterans he was born in 1946 so just after the second world war um, uh, and they dominated his sort of early life, which is why his, he had this fascination with the First World War. Um, and his grandfather had been a uh, regimental ser sergeant major of a battalion of the South Staffordshire Regiment in the 46th North Midland Division. Um, and that was one of the bonds because um, my grandfather was was a company commander and then a battalion commander in the, the in the North Staffordshire Regiment of the same 46 North Midland Division. And we worked out that the two, his, his grandfather and RSM minor CO, must have met in 1918. Um, so there was that sort of curious full circle and, and, and coming together again. It was that sort of multiplicity of, 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 of different periods, uh, really getting to know and understand the soldiers. Um, and I mentioned earlier that, that one of his other jobs was he was a JP um, and he sat uh, in Portsmouth. Um, and so... It, you know, he was endlessly digging soldiers out of legal trouble by sitting on the bench, sort of um, uh, 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 judging on what, what, what Britain's finest soldiers, sailors and airmen were doing when dr drink had been taken uh, in too excessive quantities. Um, so he saw all sort of 
every sort of end of the scale. Um, and, you know, one of his very first books was, was The Little Field Marshal, which was about Field Marshal Sir John French, um, who commanded the BEF at the, first, at the beginning of the First World War. Um, so he, he looked at things right at the top. And uh, I, I think, you know, the other thing was that after he, he stepped down as, as uh, Lieutenant Colonel commanding the 2nd Battalion of the Wessex Regiment, um, which he used to call Two Shock Wessex in Soviet in Cold War. <laughs> uh, he then went to Staff College as an instructor, and he was the only, you know, reservist academic uh, instructor on the staff. And so there was an entire generation of British generals who all owed their academic prowess and understanding and historical understanding to Richard Holmes. There wasn't a senior officer in the British Army that he didn't know. Um, and all the Navy and Air Force personnel who also went through um, the, the Army Staff College at, at Camberley and then later on at, at Shriveland also you know, knew him. So um, he had that instant connectivity with um, you know, the entire senior hierarchy of, of the British military system um, that no one else had. And because he was the outsider, it didn't matter to him. Um, if uh, if someone sort of took offence as to what he said, because you know his career was elsewhere, so he was that safe pair of hands. And often um, uh, people would turn to him, our senior generals, for for mentoring and guidance. Uh, he knew both the brigadiers in um, uh, all the commanders in First UK Armoured Division um, in the First World War, in the the First Gulf War, Operation Granby, which thirty years ago. Um, and they were both privately writing him emails, telling him what was going on and, and uh, you know, throwing up potential problems um, for, you know, for him to advise on. So it's, it's that level of tapping into the, deep into the nervous system of the British military system that got him to understand those at the top, but also those right at the bottom, because it was those letters and diaries that he mined in his various books and whether he's you know, writing about the, the redcoats of Marlborough and Wellington. Um, or the, the British Indian uh, Army. He absolutely loved writing and researching. That, that book became Saab, uh, or the Tommy of the First World War. I mean, all, you know, and, 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 and the Second World War soldiers, of course, he interviewed, and, and we saw all, many of the interviews on uh, television. So I think you know, everything in his life was about communicating with soldiers and then communicating what he had learned from them to us. Uh, and he was such a brilliant communicator that we all get it, we understand it, and he brought us much closer to to the British serviceman than I think any other historian has ever managed to do. Go on, Marcus, bring up Wellington. Oh yeah, oh no, just reflecting. I was feeling very poignant then. I was thinking, I've got you know the copy of uh, the old part. I've got Dusty Warriors in front of me, and the copy of that is a guy from PWR looking quite dejected and the the dedications to Snotty, to Dribble, to Lee Boy and the, the, he's dedicated it to the men, not the generals and who went through that battle. I thought it was really good. Yeah, um, not that long ago, I can admit it now, uh, I don't work there anymore. Um, it was a very quiet day at Apsley House and I thought, oh, what will I do? You know, it's a Sunday, we're closed, it's locked down. I'm literally sat here to watch the security cameras. No one's going to respond to an email, it's a Sunday afternoon. I know... Richard Holmes, The Iron Duke on YouTube. And I think it was like 50 minutes. And I was absolutely captivated. It's a subject I knew quite well. And even then, he's highlighting things like Wellington uh, offering his resignation if uh, the, the Catholic Emancipation Act wasn't thrown in. And I was there going, yes, I knew he offered it. But I didn't really actually realise kind of the significance of him going into the office. And you've got him there. I can't remember where they, they must have filmed it, but you've got Richard walking down a corridor, throwing open a door and kind of that. And it was very Wellington-esque, actually, I have to admit. Um, I think he would have kind of got on quite well with the great Duke. Uh, yeah, it kind of made me, made me think about that as well. Um, he didn't do too many on individuals. He did big campaigns and the soldiers. So actually, for me, to be selfish, to do a Wellington is quite nice and it's a really approachable there's so many biographies of Wellington people always ask me to recommend one and I have to sit on the fence because there are so many living historians who write them but it is a really accessible and it's very hard with Wellington to not just concentrate on his military uh, it'd be so easy to do because there are about 40 victories and three draws and one 
kind of defeat. Uh, and there's a lot there to kind of unpick. But actually, the man's life was really interesting. And I think that's what's so nice about uh, Richard Holmes doing the Iron Duke is he actually does a huge segment on life after Waterloo. And there's, there's really rich British history of political history, uh, which is a little bit more unusual, but it kind of has that golden thread of the soldier who wants to be a politician and doesn't quite understand it. And I think that, again, is is quite relatable. But there you go. There's, there's is a controversial question for both of you, and you, you can not answer. Do you have a favourite book by Holmes and Bone too? Goodness me. Right. Well, that's, that's a, a, a huge challenge. I think Marlborough was his most academically significant. Um, he dipped into a, a subject that's not so well known and actually produced a lot of original um, research. And the Cadogan family were terribly um, flattered and impressed that he was the first one to um, to mine their ancestors' papers for, for a, a modern um, you know, take on, on the man that, that he served, um, uh, the Duke of Marlborough. But you know, Wellington, I remember going down to Stratfield Say, and they said, oh, your boss has just been here. He's just been diving through the papers. Uh, and wherever you went, there was the footprints of Richard Holmes. And he 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 was the man himself. He didn't employ researchers like so many um, great historians do uh, or have done. Um, he did the, the legwork himself. And he was the one who rolled his sleeves up and, and got du- dusty and dirty in the archives. That's w- really, you know, another aspect of the man. He, he loved doing that sort of work himself. I think the, 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 the book I really loved because I loved the subject was In the Footsteps of Churchill, which is a military um, biography of Winston Churchill. And, you know, he went out to South Africa. He walked those battlefields where Churchill had fought and was taken prisoner. Um, he went to every house or flat or apartment that Winston Churchill had ever lived in, in London uh, and elsewhere. Um, so all his various uh, flats uh, and apartments. And, you know, he suddenly found in, in Churchill's letters references to, to the view from the window. And he realised he was in, you know, the study that Churchill had used um, when he was living in, in in one particular place and and you know, he looked across the the the, uh, the road and he could see exactly the same view and then then realized that was cropping up in a letter that he he'd also consulted earlier so you know it reaffirmed his uh, real deep forensic research for, for, for all of these things but of course richard was a great traveler just like winston churchill as well he loved traveling wherever he he went um, and timing was with him he went to he one of his other rides was riding the hindu kush um, sort of, you know, across what is sort of Afghanistan and a bit of you know, Iran and so on. Now, that would be unthinkable, but this is just pre-9-11. And he did that with a wonderful retired general called General Sir Evelyn Webb Carter, who used to command um, uh, London District. And they and a few other chums uh, flew out, uh, rented horses and did the Khyber Pass and you know, all sorts of weird and wonderful places you just couldn't do now. Um, you would be, you know, eviscerated within minutes um, were you to, to attempt to do that. But he did this with deep, deep historical knowledge in a very old-fashioned way. I mean, he, you know, the, his his uh, his travelling companions and the routes they planned. I mean, this was something straight out of the 1930s. Uh, so, you know, he he had all these privileged insights that so many of the rest of us just will 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 never ever gain. Um, and always it was this lesson that, you know, try and try and stretch your boundaries of studying history as, as wide as you possibly can. Um, I remember going to Gallipoli once and he said, if ever you go to Gallipoli, Peter, make sure you go across the strait and, and do Troy. You can't, you know, Troy commands the, that, that waterway, the Dardanelles, and, and has always done so. And, and, you know, that's why the city was so important. That's why it was attacked by um, the Athenians, and uh, that's why it, it, it's attacked again in 1915. And of course, as, as luck would have it, years later, I was doing a battlefield tour of Gallipoli for the uh, the CGS, who said, "Oh, can we uh, can we go across to Troy?" And I thought, ah, Richard, thank you so much, because I was able to say, "Yes, I'm very familiar with that." So, um, whenever you want. Rather than shuffling nervously and saying, "God, I don't know anything about that," you know, I, I only do first world war, sir. Um, and you know, that, that's the, you know, that's that's the legacy. It, it, it's this one long chain of events from, I mean, you know, he, 
I had trouble one day talking about Romans, and he said, "Well, it's quite easy because nothing in nothing in uh, military history has changed." So a, a Roman NCO used to wear a, a white tunic. Um, he put his armor on top, but because he was an NCO, he he was allowed to to leave an inch of his white tunic sleeve outside of the armor, and those became the white stripes, the tapes of NCOs in the British Army. And the the red of the tunic of a a tribune. I never knew that. No, I just I just I'm, hold on, wait. <laughs> so I just got to knowledge. Wait a minute. I was in the army thirty years. I never knew that. <laughs> you know, and so a tribune who who would be the equivalent of a brigade or a divisional commander. They wore um, <laughs> they wore red capes, and that red is reflected in the red tabs of senior British officers. Gorget, gorget patches. Gorget patches, exactly. So there's complete and total continuity. And, um, you know, we did a, we did a little, uh, teaching once on some battlefield as to how Romans did bridging because they had bridging columns, which, you know, the sappers with the sappers loved hasn't changed in 2000 years. They actually had their own pontoons. And then we went through sort of, you know, cohorts and legions, uh, and so on and how they're in certain centuries. And how they equate it to modern companies, battalions, and brigades, uh, and they do. Um, and you know, it's, it's that connection of understanding that actually, you know, it, Roman history or medieval history or Napoleonic the Napoleonic era is simply a development of what what had gone before that brings us up to the present day. We are not so different to how things had gone on in the past. Uh, and if you drill down to what the private soldier was experiencing. Which is what Richard was so good at doing. That gives you your continuity, and and so you're, you know, what fascinated him was being on a battlefield that had been fought over several times through the centuries. Um, and we went to the Somme once, and we were talking to a local archaeologist who was producing Roman coins and saying there was a Roman villa here. And Richard absolutely loved that. But you know that you know that sense of uh, of continuity. I do remember also walking across the battlefield of Albuera in Spain, which was a clash in 1811. It's the only battle uh, in the Peninsula campaign. Wellington wasn't actually present at, but but he was then there. Uh, Richard was there because his PWRR uh, antecedent regiments had all fought at Albuera. And uh, there was going to be a big reenactment, and we walked across um, the old battlefield. And the plough had just been in, and they grubbed up two olive groves. Uh, and twice I stooped down and picked up a musket ball. Now, Albuera was only fought on one day, and there was no other military activity there at all. And I held in my hand these two musket balls that had to have been fired on that one day. And Richard picked them up and said, that's interesting. They're both English. And that one is flattened, so that's hit someone or something. And so, you know, straight away, there was that deep, deep knowledge, and he could tell you exactly what was going. He'd say, no, that, those had a range of about 200 yards, so let's work out where this chap's firing position was. And so straight away, you know, we were in there, you know, archaeologically, he, he, he got the firing line straight away. Um, and I, that would have taken six people to sort of work out what the weapon was, and, and or he knew it all. He had it all um, at his fingertips. Wow. That's mega impressive, and all I can say is I only read Dusty Warriors, written by Richard Holmes, but as a result of this, I'm going to be going out and getting some more Richard Holmes books, uh, although I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to keep up with the books that Peter Hart keeps writing uh, and flogging at, at, no, at, at any, any cost. So, uh, but uh, I think that the soldier point, I don't think any, many, many uh, red coat, yeah, red coat, I don't think any, many military history books will have um, Portaloos stuff with corn mags, which, uh, which is in Dusty Warriors. And uh, and that is a uh, tribute to the, the modern Tommy, as it were, or the semi-modern Tommy, going back to 2004. That's all I can say, though. Yeah, but... yeah it, it, Dusty Warriors is, yeah. a, is a brilliant read, actually, to give you that the, the modern soldier. Uh, oh, blimey, fading into history. And I know, I know people who were there. It's a bit shocking, too. Um, John, Matt, have you, have you got a favourite Holmes? Because I, I started reading, I, I started reading books properly after the Sharp series started, and Redcoat sort of landed just as just as those those films had finished, and I'd read all the books, 
And it was like, I've got to go back and read them again because that completely changed my view of Napoleonic warfare. Like you were saying, Peter, this, this sort of, you know, not the heroic daring do, but the, the guts it took just to stand in line and load and fire and load and fire. It, it was, it was brilliant. And my other favorite one comes with me on holiday all the time is Faisal Avenue. Oh yes. Yeah. Cause whenever you, whenever you go to France, it's, you know, it, to be fair, there's a bit of a guidebook to hell, isn't it? It's like on this spot, all of this happened over the course of the last 500 years. And it's, it's, it's wonderful to have with you when you're, when you're traveling around in, um, in Northern France. I just think it's, it's very succinct. It covers so much. And it will, you know, it will give you pause to just look around at the ground and those sort of images and those moments where uh, Richard will just say something in, in Faisal Avenue that you'll sort of look and see a hill, but you don't really see the hill in your mind's eye. You're seeing just so much more from that incredibly eloquent and succinct way he had of, of conveying things. Faisal Avenue was the first guidebook he really wrote, uh, intended as a guidebook. His his doctorate was on um, the French army uh, of the, the sort of latter half of the 19th century. So, you know, very much at the time of the Franco-Prussian War. Um, and he went across many of those battlefields, which, you know, are, are little visited now, but were hugely popular um, for study, certainly by military officers before the First World War. Um, because that's how everyone thought if a future war was going to be fought. Um, so his his knowledge of all things French um, was huge. Uh, he spoke French, uh, and of course he absolutely loved French food and wine. Uh, and so many of our battlefield tours ended up in in France, where he would do the ordering, and he knew his way, you know, up and down, sideways, and, and in every different different direction across a wine list. Um, uh, and all the aperitifs, and then digestives. <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> so you, you, his 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 life and and everything about him was so well rounded. You you not only got the battlefield, you not only got the learning and the reading. Um, if you were lucky, you would get a bit of Siegfried Sassoon um, thrown in, um, and some poetry because he was word perfect on a memoirs of an infantry officer. And the first volume, which I think was probably his favourite, Memoirs of a Fox Hunter. Uh, but he could quote long, long paragraphs from memory. Um, he had this sort of not just um, encyclopedic memory, but also a photographic one in terms of you know, being able to go to uh, sort of store away um, huge quantities of sort of accurate, um, quotable print. Um, but it all led to this huge love affair of, of France. Um, so one of the lovely touching things was, you know, not only did the British give him the, uh, make him a commander of the Order of the British Empire, um, the Danes, because he was Colonel, Honorary Colonel of the Princess of Wales Royal Regiment, whose uh, uh, Colonel in Chief uh, was Princess Margaret of Denmark. She, she made him a Knight of the Dannebrog, which is a sort of uh, uh, Danish royal decoration. But the French gave him a, uh, a the Medal of, of the Order of uh, Arts and Letters, which he was terribly pleased about because that had been established by Napoleon. So to, to have his uh, scholarship uh, recognised by the French with a medal that Napoleon had instituted himself at the same time as the, the Légion d'Honneur um, was a sort of supreme accolade. Uh, he, he was very, very sort of touched by that. Um, so that was always another aspect to, to Holmes on tour, which was, um, you know, supper, grinding your way through various French restaurants uh, and passing judgments on the moule uh, <laughs> and the, the claret or whatever it happened to be. Gents, I'm just looking at the time. We've, we've been going for about an hour now, so I think let's, let's start wrapping up. This has been absolutely fantastic. I think once, once lockdown is passed, we should get together and raise a, raise a glass of claret to, to Richard together because... Um, I think that'd be it. And I, I am going to leave the last word to Twitter um, to Hugo Drax, who I'm assuming is not the Hugo Drax, who should still be floating around in space after the end of Moonraker. Um, but he, <laughs> <laughs> he just simply said Richard was top quality. And I think, I think we can all agree wholeheartedly with that. So Cameron McNish, Pisa Caddick Adams, and of course, Marcus. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think it's given good tribute, uh, all of you, to uh, the man's legacy, his memory, and uh, his, the love for him is obviously so strong out there. So thank you all. Thank you. I like to think he's with the great muster beyond, and as we raise a glass to him, he'll be raising a glass back to us.
I'd like to thank Peter Caddock Adams and Cameron McNish for joining Marcus and I as we reminisce about the late, great Richard Holmes. If you've not yet discovered Richard and his works, we've created a small list of his books on our bookshop, which you can find at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack. You can find most of the books that we've talked about today, including Peter's as well, and 10% of every sale from our bookshop goes to supporting History Hack. There are, of course, more ways you can support us too. In 2020, when the boss ladies Alex and Alina started History Hack, the world was very strange, and unfortunately, it looks like 2021 is going to be equally strange. We would love it if you're able to support the podcast in any way. It will allow us to keep up the regularity of the pods and also the great guests that we've been able to bring you over the last year. We exist on Patreon as History Hack and also on Podbean, our podcast host's own platform called Patreon. The reward tiers are being updated at the moment, so there's going to be some fantastic options for you to choose from. So if you're able to support us, that would be fantastic. So we thank you very much and until the next time. Bye. Don't forget that we do exist on Patreon as History Hack and on Patreon as well, which is Podbean's own version. Uh, Alina and I have had massive fun doing this in 2020, uh, but life's going to change quite a lot next year and we're going to actually have to go and earn a living, etc. If we want to keep up the regularity that we've been bringing you and the kind of guests that we've been bringing you and the workload, then we will need your help. So uh, if you join... There's going to be incentives for joining on either of those platforms. We're revamping ourselves on both of them. So don't forget to go in. You can do as little as a dollar a month and it all goes towards keeping up History Hack as regular as we've been able to bring it to you this year. When our guests join us to talk about their work and their new book, the 45 minutes or so they spend with us is just a taster of all their efforts. So to this end, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org where you can find our guests' latest and greatest books. You can support them, and you can support History Hack too. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep at it and bring you more amazing guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash hack history, or just search on bookshop.org for us under the shops bit. Thank you for your continued support, and here's to your next great book.